Hi, I'm Leandro Leviste, founder of Solar Philippines, and you're tuned in to Power Podcast. Welcome to Power Podcast, where we do an in-depth discussion on all issues relevant to the Philippines energy sector with some of the most quotable newsmakers and important decision makers in the industry. Power Podcast is a production of Power Philippines, the only online publication in the country dedicated to covering energy developments across the archipelago. We cover all news and issues which spark meaningful conversations among members of our growing online community. Like them, we believe that sustaining the growth of the energy sector is vital to the growth of the country itself. I'm your host, Francis Respicio. Let's get on with the show. Good day to all of you, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or listening to us on Spotify. Google or Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast. Thank you for joining us in another edition of Power Podcast. But of late, one company and even the man or millennial behind it have stood out from the rest, not only in the eyes of the general public and the Power Philippines community, but also with foreign investors. Solar Philippines is a young and rising solar energy company that currently owns and operates farms in Calatagan, Batangas, Concepcion, Tarlac, and most recently, the 500-megawatt solar ranch in Peñaranda, Nueva Ecija. And joining us today is the CEO and founder of Solar Philippines, Mr. Leander Leviste. Sir Leander, or should we go with Lian? Uh, thank you yeah. for joining us here in Power Podcast. Yes, Lian is fine. And thank you for the invitation. All right. And uh, let's start with, uh, with the latest developments. And uh, just the other day, uh, we got uh, we got news that uh, the comp- that the company shareholders have approved the expansion of uh, of SPNEC, this uh, 10, uh, 10 gigawatt expansion drive, which some have said or have called as aggressive. It's an aggressive expansion. So first, why this aggressive expansion? And second, uh, some may some uh, may ask why SPNEC as a corporate vehicle instead of Solar Philippines itself. Thank you for this timely question. The company is responding to the Department of Energy's policy to encourage renewable energy projects through the Renewable Portfolio Standard, for which the target has been increased to 35% of the country's energy needing to be sourced from renewable energy by 2030, which, if much of this will come from solar, would translate to over 20,000 megawatts of solar that will need to be installed in the Philippines. I think the industry is in agreement that there will be demand for a large capacity of solar. And the question that people more often ask is, can the supply be delivered? And it is that which our company is trying to solve by being a focused solar project developer that will make it easier, hopefully, for the country's power companies to go into solar, through which SPNEC would be our vehicle for these developments, which have been worked on by Solar Philippines for many years, but which, with the response to all of the recent developments, we think that this would be the timeliest way for us to respond to the opportunities before us. Uh, you've mentioned, uh, Lian, that uh, you'd rather focus on being a developer than being an IPP or independent power producer. Uh, why Why would you go rather with that shift in, in strategy? Yeah, so the business model of development and producing the power from that which you develop has often been combined and to be clear our company still produces power through the ownership of the plants but we have recognized that the greatest value is created in the development because there is no shortage of companies who would like to own and operate the power plants but there is not enough solar project sites for all of this demand and as I noted in the previous question's response, we are acting with urgency now to meet 
this demand. Okay. Uh, got that, sir. And um, with what companies or uh, power producers do you plan to uh, work with? Like, for example, uh, you have a partnership with ASEN for the... Um, uh, for in, in some of your projects so like what other companies are you looking to um, have uh, partnerships with that's a very good question because i think the interest by the country's power companies in supporting larger scale solar projects is key to making these plans into reality and we will leave it to our partners who are also publicly listed to make the disclosures at their appropriate time. Mm -hmm. And there is, I think, a lot of information already in the public domain about certain of our partnerships where one of them has a large share of the overall portfolio already in the public domain. And what we have also signified is that there are existing agreements for the target capacity of 10 gigawatts that we have been developing already with partners subject to milestones that we hope in uh, near term may be met so that the partners for the entire 10 gigawatts can also become publicly disclosed. All right. Let me summarize but, this. Yeah, yes, yes. We do want to do this in partnership with the country's power companies because only when everyone is on board practically will we have the will to make the transition happen as fast as possible. Hmm. So let me uh, summarize this quickly. So you, you intend to reach the 10 gigawatt target and this is nationwide, right? Nationwide. Uh, 10 gigawatt, you intend to reach the 10 gigawatt target through part, mainly through partnerships. Yes, yeah, so that's why we make the differentiation between the developer and the IPP. The developer's main job is consolidating the land and permits, which we have recognized to be the main bottleneck for solar in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. The IPP will build, own, and operate it for the next 25 years. While we also are shareholders in the power plants that develop the energy over 25 years, our main value creation is in the development prior to the operations. So our company will be focusing on laying the groundwork for these projects. And when they are shovel ready is when our IPP partners come in to operate it for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, this has, of course, also been already demonstrated in our existing solar farms, which are under joint ventures. All right. Uh, you mentioned bottlenecks. I'm, I'd like to follow uh, follow up on this because I'm, I'm curious. Uh, what are the bottle, what kinds of bottlenecks do you encounter uh, being a developer? So, so that our audience could just uh, could understand uh, what uh, what kinds of dilemmas do you experience, and how does the how uh, how do these become roadblocks in setting up uh, these projects that you have in the pipeline? So that that is the key question. The fundamental bottleneck is geographic, because the Philippines has a large population in a small space between central and southern Luzon, mm -hmm. where the demand and the grid is focused. So while there's a lot of land further out in the Philippines to serve the demand centers of Luzon, one needs to be located in these densely populated areas. And in these areas, ownership is often with uh, small parcels of many, many owners, even per parcel, many family members. And that's really what we do from day to day, consolidating and helping make ready for the construction of a solar project, what would be small, unusable parcels of land into larger parcels that are fitting for solar farms, which we think 
are key to also making solar economic, to have economies of scale. Mm, all right. That, that's interesting. And uh, I found it interesting there, unused, that uh, phrase that you used earlier, unusable uh, pieces of land. Uh, I'm going to ask about that later. But uh, for now, I'm going to... I have here with me uh, your latest release where it where it's, uh, it mentions a it's uh, quite a long list of where your assets are located. Um, I noticed that um, some here have potential capacities of 1,200 megawatts, 1,600 megawatts. And uh, I think these are already, please correct me if I'm wrong, years in the making because I saw this in a DOE document uh, some time ago. Uh, so what what are your uh, what are your plans? Where do you plan to develop further these projects? And um, what are your priority locations? Uh, you you have your Leyte, you have your Batangas, uh, but what is your uh, or what are your criteria mainly for determining these uh, projects, these places where to put your projects? Yeah, so there's already quite a lot that is available in the public domain. And the more specific locations that I can say right now are in the vicinity of central and southern Luzon because that's where the demand is. Mm -hmm. And the focus of the company has been for these projects, which we have been consolidating the ingredients for for many years to become shovel ready at the soonest time. Areas further out may in the distant future be used when the transmission can get built there. But among a larger pipeline of projects, one can funnel it down to our most mature projects, which makes us confident that we can deliver the 10 gigawatts of construction ready sites by 2025. Mm, all right. And in this list also, I'd just like to follow uh, follow up on something. In this list, I saw here a Laguna de Bay solar project. So I'd like to clarify, I'd like to just to clarify if floating solar is an option for you also. Actually, we have really cast our net wide to the many possibilities for solar development in the Philippines. And as I said earlier, our total potential capacity is greater than our 10 gigawatt development target. And not all of the projects on that list are projects that we will prioritize. Mm -hmm. I can say that the ones that we will prioritize are the ones where we have existing smaller solar farms operating, where we're comfortable with the local area, and mm -hmm. we believe that simply by expanding on what we have and the work that we have done, for example, in Batangas, Tarlac, and Nueva Ecija, we should be able to deliver it faster than in a purely greenfield development plan. Okay. All right. So between um, Batangas, yes. Tarlac, and Nueva Ecija, as well as its neighboring area of Bulacan, we mm -hmm. think that a lot of capacity will be able to be developed. All right. Thank you for that, sir. And then, uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, Batangas, uh, in, Calatag in Calatagan in particular, um, you have Tarlac, you have uh, Nueva Ecija. And uh, we actually saw, you mentioned demand also. They're close to the demand centers. And we've also observed in the, um, in the Global Solar Atlas that um, that we've also actually shared with uh, with your team that uh, irradiation, if my term is uh, correct, is uh, actually good in those places. Um, but uh, we've also gotten some comments about why, um, like why these areas in particular, uh, why these areas in particular, uh, are there other factors that say, uh, in terms of technical te technical factors, uh, why these why these three areas in particular? So other than demand, uh, focusing on technical factors, uh, why these three areas? That's a good question because we want to emphasize that because of the scarcity of areas, 
the first factor is really the availability of land of sufficient proximity. And it's not really about where is the best, but where there's even available. Because it's really hard to even just find 10,000 megawatts of land worth available to begin with. And it happens to be in the aforementioned places where we are in enough proximity to Manila and we have already been uh, spending a lot of time and our resources to consolidate the ingredients for the projects in this area. All right. Now, speaking of Nueva Ecija, um, of course, we're all wondering because when you when Solar Philippines first came out with that release about uh, the solar ranch, it really got a lot of people interested. And where are we now? Uh, at what stage are we with the construction of the of the solar ranch? So, if I'm if my information is right, it's 225 uh, megawatt uh, peak. That's the intended uh, capacity to be commissioned this year. So are we on track with that one? Uh, how are we with the developments there? Yes, yeah, so our first phase funded from the IPO is the 50 megawatts, which the solar panels with their associated components should be very easily installed. And it is the transmission to NGCP in Cabanatuan, which would really be the critical path. So we are focused on making sure that the interconnection is dealt with as fast as possible. And of course, we will be giving the public the frequent updates as the target completion date approaches on the status of the transmission to MGCP. But as for the solar panels and the associated components of the plant, there should be no problem with the construction of the plant even ahead of schedule, as far as the plant that we are constructing is concerned. All right, that's that's great to hear. That's great to hear, Leanne. And uh, now I'd want to ask about the asset share for swap because when we were doing stories about this, of course we were also uh, we're all we were asking about uh, okay, how is this going to be done? Uh, why are they doing it? And uh, that and that's actually our first question: Why an asset for? Uh, why an asset for share swap with Solar Philippines? Yes, thank you. So the alternative would, of course, be for Solar Philippines to be separate from the publicly listed subsidiary SPNEC. Mm -hmm. And it was in the wake of the strong demand for the offering of SPNEC that we said perhaps it may be good to combine the assets of the company in this already very well-received stock and that many of the people who wanted to buy stock in SPNEC were asking us for the same, especially in the succeeding weeks when they were saying, okay, can we already have uh, operating assets with profit in 2022? So we're quite often talking to our public shareholders and potential institutional investors in the company. And our actions are always being adjusted in accordance with the feedback that we are getting from them. And I, I think that's one of the good things about being a young company. Uh, we can be quite nimble in adjusting to what's happening in the market. But uh, we hope also that the combining of both greater scale and some operating assets that will contribute to the revenues already of SPNEC this year will make SPNEC more able to access wider bases of capital, including from foreign institutional investors that will hopefully make our company's development plans happen uh, with greater uh, speed if SPNEC can be able to uh, raise the additional capital with the support of these uh, foreign institutional investors. All right. Um, and another question about asset for share swap. 
uh, could you give us a, well, for those of us who are not knowledgeable about how the process works, um, could you explain to us, like, like a, briefly have a, uh, give us a walkthrough about how that works and how would be, uh, how that would be beneficial, especially for investors. Yeah, because so actually, I think many of your viewers who are active participants of the Philippine Stock Exchange know mm -hmm. more about asset per share swaps than us because we only <laughs> learned about this from reading about other companies that have recently been doing these uh, corporate uh, actions in the uh, recent years where we're exchanging shares in our privately held solar projects in exchange also for shares in SPNEC. And the result, as detailed in our comprehensive corporate disclosure, is SPNEC will go from being the sister of these several solar projects into being the parent of mm. these several solar projects. And we are doing it on terms that we hope the public will see are advantageous in terms of the potential value for share because the proposition of the company before was eight plus billion shares outstanding for one project and we're only issuing three times as many shares in exchange for we've listed over 20 solar entities so 20 times more for only three times as many shares meaning that the resulting four times outstanding shares with over, let's say, 20 times more potential capacity would mean a much higher potential value per share. But of course, all of this is subject to execution of the developments. But if the consideration for the transaction is shares for shares, then we've deliberately done the ratio of shares to be issued to be such that it is supposed to be advantageous if all of this is uh, materialized in the near term. All right. Thanks for that. And uh, another uh, question we'd want to ask, um, maybe for an update, uh, about the uh, planned stock rights offering. So. Uh, any update about the uh, SRO? The last word that we had is uh, second quarter. Within the second quarter, ang uh, balak nyo sa na yes. through the SRO. Well, I, uh, thank you for asking this question because it's one that we have been receiving a lot, and hopefully the following principles will answer the inquiries. Our Current authorized capital stock is for a total of 10 billion shares, of which 8.124 billion are issued and outstanding, and we have a 1.876 billion unissued. We have just gotten approval from the stockholders to increase it to 50 billion shares. So mm -hmm. we could theoretically do the accelerated share issuance for the first 1.876 billion shares, which may be a uh, option as it's close to the current outstanding public shares of the company, or we may wait for the increase of ACS to be approved by the SEC. So what I'm saying is just based on the information that's already public in regards to the uh, proposed increase of capital stock and we are evaluating how fast we can accelerate the process then if we can file the SRO prior to the SEC approval on the increase of capital stock or if the increase of capital stock can be approved very soon then even better. Now, that being the case in terms of the timing and the number of shares that may be issued, in terms of the price, I think that any SRO, IPO, or FOO has a price setting date by which time the final price is determined based on 
the sounding off to the market of what the right price would be to meet the demand. But it is so it goes without saying that the price needs to be attractive and of course a discount to the other ways that people can avail of shares so that the company will be able to place its requisite number of shares to the market. So as much as we would love to make everything happen overnight, rest assured that we are working uh, very long hours to make it happen as soon as people hope it does. And we uh, hope that the foregoing principles that we are trying to make it happen sooner and that the price will need to be, of course, at an attractive discount to the market uh, would be some guidance as to uh, what it would be. And uh, we hope that when we finally file the SRO, hopefully soon, that uh, these questions will be all the more answered. All right, all right. Thanks for that. Now I'd like to go back a bit to the uh, that point about the unusable uh, unusable land. So I'll go back to those um, those uh, concerns uh, because one main uh, one main comment or I even say I even say criticism hurled against solar farms in general is that why build a solar farm on land that could have been used for agriculture. So what is your take on this? Yes, so I just want to clarify when I used the word unusable a while ago, that was unusable for project developments when they are oh, okay. All right. scattered parcels of land, All right. which is All right. why we seek to consolidate them and make them bigger blocks because economies of scale is really important in this business. Now, as to the prior status of the land, of course, most of this land is zoned as agricultural, mm. if not pasture land, as in the case of uh, certain of our uh, more publicized developments. And the reason that we're able to even um, buy it off of the current owners is because they aren't getting much income from the land, because some of this land is unirrigated rice lands, pasture lands, sugarcane that may not be a very good investment for some of these owners nowadays. Mm -hmm. And we are hopeful that the uh, change of ownership of these lands will benefit the owners who uh, will be able to make better use of their land proceeds, but moreover, will be able to create more and better paying employment for the locals. So whereas the land was previously unproductive, again, that's how we are able to even access that land. When it is a solar farm, it would produce more jobs per hectare with a higher income for the local community per hectare. Mm -hmm which is why compared to other power plants and even agribusinesses, industries, it's relatively easy to get the local communities to embrace the solar projects. Because here you have something that not only is producing electricity that will solve our country's power demand needs, but also create good employment without having negative externalities because it's a uh, uh, relatively harmless and uh, actually oftentimes welcomed asset to have in a community all right thanks for it thank you for that uh Leanne. and uh with all that's been said and all the developments around uh, the industry in and around the industry now i'd like to ask you this if is it possible for the Philippines to go 100% solar? And how? If yes, how? And why? If wow. no, why not? <laughs> Francis, that's my favorite question because <laughs> uh, it's what I think about a lot. I think a lot of our company's strategy can be attributed to our age, which means that we can think for the next 30 years. So 
maybe in 30 years, anything is possible. But I want to emphasize in the short term, there's maybe over 20 gigawatts of other technologies, power plants that are already in existence in the Philippines. There's more that's under construction. All of these existing and under construction non-solar power plants will need to run their useful life. But it's the growth in demand, which will be met by a growth in supply that we think solar will be best positioned to compete in because of the low cost of solar panels relative to other sources of energy, particularly if those sources of energy are going up in their fuel prices. That means that economically, there's no longer much disagreement that solar being least cost means it should supply most of the new uh, need of the Philippines. The question has really just been the availability of the project sites, which is why that's what we're focusing on. But focusing more on your question of uh, what the net result is going to be, I think given the economics and given that over time, the project sites should be developed to meet the demand, then uh, we will be trending to higher and higher and higher share of solar in the energy mix, especially with the advent of lower cost ways to store that energy so that maybe in my lifetime, the close to 100% solar in the Philippines may be possible, just as maybe it seemed daunting for people to think that there is a close to 100% cell phone penetration now in the Philippines and even close to 100% social media penetration in the Philippines. But for people that own shares in companies that are betting on other technologies, don't worry, maybe not in your lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> like how we many, will, uh, how many years need, are we looking at? Yeah, we will still need coal, gas, and oil in the lifetime of many of your viewers. So, <laughs> well, Francis, I think the key is any energy transition takes decades. As they said, before it, the world was powered by steam engines using coal, and then they discovered oil, and then they are transitioning into renewable energy. But all of this has happened over many decades. Again, for the younger viewers of Power Podcast, in our lifetime, the 100% renewable energy, not just solar, but wind and other um, improving technologies, uh, will also become part of the mix. But uh, none of this happens overnight, and the existing sources of energy will be needed for the transition. So in our lifetime, so like how many years is that, if I may ask? <laughs> uh, well, at least the number of years for existing and under construction fossil fuel plants to run their useful life. Because once something is built, its capital cost has been expended and its incremental cost is low. So they would typically in a, a free market be up to their end of useful life. So if some are still being uh, built now, then they get completed in a few years time. Add 25 years to their completion date, uh, I would estimate would be the minimum for the supply of non-renewable energy in the country. But because the country's demand is growing, and so if you look at what the energy mix of the Philippines is going to be in 10 to 20 years, mm -hmm. most of the capacity in 10 to 20 years is already going to be from new capacity rather than from the pre-existing capacity. You know, in a, in a growing economy like the Philippines, the future is a lot bigger than the past in terms of uh, the source of uh, supply for the demand. So all of those factors are why there should be a much larger penetration of renewable in the future, trending towards 100% renewables in the younger of us's lifetime. <laughs> That's nice to hear. And 100% renewables and uh, not really 100% solar. 
or we say 100% solar? Yeah, I think the more penetration of solar there is in the Philippines, the more that you'll also need to balance it with other sources of renewable energy. Mm -hmm. It just so happens that we don't dabble in others because mm -hmm. we're focused on what we think we have a competitive advantage in. But uh, if solar can be 50% and everything else can be the other 50%, mm -hmm. then uh, I think that's plenty uh, for solar because the constraint will also become uh, coming up with all of the supply of sites mm -hmm. for that solar. All right. And maybe one last question uh, regard, uh, re relative to that one. Uh, do you think that the current, uh, the current conflict in uh, between Russia and uh, Ukraine would um, would speed up the uh, the demand for uh, for the for the development of renewable energy in the country because gas prices are going up uh, now we have news that news about coal uh, coal going up so would that uh, in your view speed up the development of renewable energy in the country no doubt because Solar energy is a technology that is less affected by the global increase in commodity prices. So its relative competitiveness to other technologies has significantly increased over the past weeks. And we don't count on all of these positive tailwinds, but when you have basically the weakening of fossil fuel in addition to the accelerated push for energy independence and the decarbonization of the energy mix, I think that there's a lot to be optimistic about in the prospects of solar energy, even in the near term. All right, all right. And, uh, and uh, on, uh, on that note, We'd like to uh, thank you, uh, Lian, for giving uh, for giving your thoughts, for uh, sharing your insights uh, with us here on the Power Podcast. And um, can we have any final thoughts from you, uh, Lian, before we uh, close this episode? Yes, I would like to thank Power Philippines for educating the rest of us on the happenings in this now very exciting industry of electricity and. We hope that your listeners who come from the many parts of this industry, including from the conventional side of the industry, will continue to increasingly embrace this renewable energy transition because I think it's going to end up being uh, the best opportunity for everyone in the near term even to not resist, but to embrace the change that will help our country have a lower cost and more renewable source of energy. All right, and uh, thank you very much again, uh, Lian, for this uh, for this very uh, educational uh, interview and it's a very insightful episode that you've uh, given us here on Power Podcast. And that wraps up today's Power Podcast. Tune in next time as we converse with the movers and shakers of the country's energy sector. For your comments and suggestions, shoot us an email at Power Philippines Facebook Messenger account or email us at news.powerphilippines at gmail.com. And of course, be updated on the country's energy sector by visiting www.powerphilippines.com and by liking us on Facebook. If you want to view this podcast again, check out our YouTube channel at Power Philippines News. Again, that's Power Philippines News. I'm Francis Respicio. Have a powerful day ahead.